summer 2004 and a murder which shocks the country. A middle-aged couple are shot dead in their bungalow in a quiet seaside town on the east coast. More shocking still, it has the hallmarks of a gangland execution. The hunt for the killers is to lead detectives to an organized crime gang built on drugs and held together by violence. They kill people, they torture people, they terrorize people. The number one murder suspect, seemingly untouchable gang leader Colin Gunn, overlord of a tough council estate. Dozens of police operations have failed to find evidence to bring Gunn to court and he has spies in the force. We've been working on it, nothing's come of it, got no evidence. This was just, you know, the ultimate betrayal. Will this double killing give detectives the ammunition to put an end to gun law? This was a killing which took place in broad daylight on a beautiful summer's afternoon. Whether or not you would describe it as a professional killing, I've got to try and keep an open mind about that. I'm still awaiting results of tests that are still going on down at the scene. But from the outset, detectives knew that was exactly what they were dealing with. The clinical execution of a couple called John and Joan Sterland on a sunny summer's afternoon at Trustthorpe in Lincolnshire was carried out with chilling efficiency by killers aware of the forensic clues they might leave behind. The brutality with which it was executed uh, was extreme. It's horrific. Neighbours were shocked to learn later that the Sterlins were in hiding in fear of their lives. They had been on the run for months, had declined places in the witness protection programme and opted instead to find their own safe haven. The events leading to the shootings had begun a year before, 80 miles from the murder scene. This is Nottingham's Bestwood estate, and the chances are, a few years ago, I wouldn't have been safe walking here, at least without the blessing of two brothers. Colin and David Gunn ran this place, some thought, pretty well, keeping crime off the streets, giving presents to the kids and handing out cash to hard-pressed families. Nobody dared to ask where the money for the handouts came from. The guns held the estate in a vice-like grip through a mixture of gratitude and fear. In the 1990s, the brothers had risen through the ranks from petty criminals to underworld figures, a rise largely unchallenged by the city's other criminals because they kept to their own patch. They're estate boys, aren't they? You know, that, that's their life. That was their little domain. That, they were, that was their comfort zone. I spent more time with Dave. So, and the time I spent with Dave was, you know, it was always laughing a joke. And if I'd got a problem, I'd say, hey, Dave, help me out, because he's a lot bigger than me, you know what I mean? But it was great. If you're tough in that place, you get a reputation. You might get a reputation as a fighter. But if you're tough and you've got a gang, you're very, very soon are known by everybody because if they cross you, they cross everybody. They cross the whole gang. The gun's gradual move from petty crime to organised crime meant that the brothers were the law on the Bestwood estate. You cross them at your peril. He doesn't have to physically intimidate anybody or beat anybody just his presence lets you know that you know you don't fuck about with his geezer he's, he's a he's a big lump you know what i mean he, only a fool would mess about with somebody like that if you were somebody of best word and you'd been burgled and you didn't like it you go for the gun to say hang on i've been burgled this isn't very nice what are you going to do about it they obviously would <laughs> present you sooner or later with your property back and the burglar would get um probably a good idea for his troubles. Many stories circulated about the gang's brutal reputation. 
We were aware of an incident of retribution during our investigations where a man who owed Colin and David good money was taken to address on the Bestwood estate where he had the fingers on both hands broken with a wheel brace. People had heard all the stories about fingers being chopped off, nailing people's hands to wooden benches. It's the behaviour of people who want to retain control of their, of their environment and clearly their own organisation. And the way, the way to exert control is to keep people in fear. Colin and David bought the loyalty of young people on the estate, primarily by showing them what they could have. They see Colin driving around with a personalised number plate, you know, big and or power. They see them draped in gold jewellery, and they want some of that themselves. The height of luxury is to get a bigger gold chain to go around your neck, is to get a car with personalised number plates on it, is to have a caravan on the East Coast, is to go to Benny Dome for your holidays. It's all right having money, it's how you use it. In 2003, John and Joan Sterland were living in Nottingham, ordinary law-abiding people who didn't want any trouble. The same could not be said of Joan's son, a local hard man called Michael O'Brien. O'Brien was not part of the gun gang and showed them neither respect nor fear. One night at the end of August, he got into a fight with Colin Gunn's nephew, Jamie, at a local pub. O'Brien decided to take it further. But in the darkness, O'Brien had killed the wrong man. Marvin Bradshaw was a totally innocent victim of that shooting. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Present in the vehicle when he was shot was Jamie Gunn, who was a nephew of Colin Gunn, who we think was the intended victim. It was a crime that Colin Gunn took personally, an attempt to assassinate one of his family. Police had to find O'Brien quickly for his own sake. We had to find him as a matter of urgency. And, you know, I'm aware that Colin and others were looking for him. It took just over a week to arrest Michael O'Brien. He was now beyond the vengeance of Colin Gunn. Not so O'Brien's mother, Joan Sterling. As she and her husband enjoyed a quiet night in, they received a visit. The message was clear. Just as Joan's son had targeted the guns nearest and dearest, so Colin Gunn would do the same. The Sterlings had no choice but to flee their home. Within hours of the shootings, they were on the run, heading up the motorway to Yorkshire. It seemed far enough away for safety, but it was not to be. A middle-aged couple are running for their lives from an organised crime gang. Its leader, Colin Gunn, intent on vengeance. John and Joan Sterland have done nothing against the gang, but Joan's son has. He's tried to assassinate a member of the Gunn family. Colin and David Gunn cultivated their criminal empire on a large council estate in Nottingham. Whilst their influence over the estate grew, at the start of the new millennium, the police were preoccupied with a different problem, an epidemic of shootings in the city. A turf war between black drugs gangs had earned Nottingham the tabloid tag of gun crime capital of Britain. Nottingham was effectively becoming a war zone. Every day, you know, another shooting. firms started to notice they couldn't get candidates, university admissions were going down. Nottinghamshire was a shire county, unused to this kind of criminality. You know, all eyes were on Nottingham.
the first time in any British city, routine patrols were armed. Then came Operation Stealth, a major effort to crack down on drugs and firearms and rescue Nottingham's reputation. It was during Operation Stealth that the police discovered something about the firearms problem that they hadn't expected. It was seen at that time very much as a problem in the black community, in the same way that um, that problem manifested itself in places like Birmingham, Manchester, London. Over time, though, probably by about 2002, I was aware that something else was happening. There were white people believed to have been shot by white people, and that told me that we didn't just have one gun problem, that we actually had two. The shooting that caught their interest was the murder of 25-year-old John Shippham, blasted as he lay in bed in a flat in Besswood. It had a gangland ring to it. I know John was involved with some bad people, but he didn't deserve this. Michael O'Brien's attempt to murder Jamie Gunn also smacked of the underworld, as did the later killing of a suspected police informant and the attempted murder of a social worker who had threatened to testify in court against young thugs who had beaten him up in a pub. If the person out there responsible for this, at the other end of this TV tube, look into these eyeballs, I'm going to hunt you down, we're going to find you, we're going to convict you, and you can ponder your future in front of the prison bars. But it was another shooting that was to add new urgency to the investigation, the murder of a woman shopkeeper in broad daylight. It was a nice sunny day, September the 30th, 2003. Two men came into the shop in motorcycle clothing with motorcycle helmets on with the visors pulled down. And the, the taller of the two people went down into his waistband and pulled a gun. My wife stepped forward from the back rear of the shop and stepped between the gunman and my daughter to protect my daughter. And he did no more than just pull the trigger and shot my wife in the chests at point blank range. It was no, no question of missing. Uh, he said, silly cow, with my wife lying dead on the floor. Nowhere is a sense of shock, outrage and loss greater than within the community where Marion lived and worked. They're evil, evil. I thought, why Marion? Why not me? Why take the good? The shooter in Marion Bates shocked so many people. It was, it, was, it was different, something we'd never experienced. It took violence to another level. The shootings had been drug-related. This was an innocent woman going around her everyday business. Police suspected a link between the botched robbery and Colin Gunn. The Peugeot that was used as a, we believe, as a getaway vehicle from that actual shooting Sometime previously had been stopped, being driven by Colin Gunn's girlfriend. That was how we believe it was linked to Colin Gunn. You can't sit here and say um, Colin Gunn murdered or was involved in murdering Marion Bates, but I think what you can say for absolute certainty is he created a climate, he created a backdrop against which that was possible. A chief suspect for the murder was a member of the Bestwood gang called James Brodie. But immediately after the killing, Brody had vanished. Had he caused too much trouble for the city's underworld? As you can see, there's a great deal of activity uh, in the background where we've moved a container uh, and we will uh, shortly start digging and, and exploring that area. The primary rumours include he was taken to a pub uh, and shot and subsequently teeth taken out and his body was burnt in a warehouse. This is the fourth location police have searched in the last nine days, but so far their efforts have failed to find any trace of James Brody. Another rumor, very similar, was uh, taken to a farm somewhere and was fed to the pigs. The rumors about what happened to James Brody are just that, rumors but they're not out of line with the way the underworld deals with its own. If he's going to put your... The
of you and your family and your friends and their family and the members of your gang, then if he's got to go, he's got to go. It's as simple as that. It's, it's the law of the jungle, you know. It's the way it's got to be. And if, if ever people think that's a ruthless mentality, no, it's survival. To this day, James Brodie has not been found, dead or alive. One man was jailed for the murder of Marion Bates and two others for robbery. The police did not have enough evidence to bring any charges against Colin Gunn. But then, Colin Gunn already knew that. During the investigation of the Bestwood gang, Nottinghamshire police quickly discovered that a sickening suspicion was becoming reality, that corrupt colleagues were working for Colin Gunn's organised crime network and feeding back damaging information, information that was putting lives at risk. Hello. Hey, mate. Hey, mate. When we were mounting a number of operations, our intelligence at the time was what we considered to be of excellent quality, and some of the operations actually returned as nothing. We didn't find what we expected to find, and didn't find people where we expected to find them. And when that happens over a period of time, you tend to suspect that information is being passed. Did you get the message? Did you have a chance to...? Uh, I've not, I, I will be today, so, uh, yeah. It's... Did you say nothing had come of that, as far as you knew? Yeah, no, we've been working on it, nothing's come of it. Got no evidence. Oh, no, any names come up? Yeah, we've got names, but it's fucking worth it. We're caught, isn't it? I think we'd always suspected that Colin Gunn and his associates were being provided information around police activity and police operations from within our own organisation. That's being clever, you know, in the day it's, it's called watching the back, isn't it? It's, it's having someone in the other camp. It's no different than what, what, the, what goes in the world with spies. Don't we stick spies in other camps? Don't we stick our people in Russia, and China? You know, same thing, innit? It's having a spy in another camp to watch out, let you know what's going on. To have the kind of organisation that Colin Gunn and his henchmen had, they could only sustain that by corrupting people. And I think any chief constable who said, I've got organised crime, but I haven't got a corruption problem, I think is deluding him or herself. Um, so, you know, it was part of my professional assessment and my college professional assessment that we would find it. He had access to people in the council, in the police, in social services, in the health service, all of whom were willing to give information about the whereabouts of somebody. So you could place somebody into witness protection, but unless that was firewalled, those people were going to be found. I knew that somewhere out there, there were corrupt police officers who, if we didn't catch and stop and put in prison, um, that the guns would continue to sustain themselves. IT experts quickly established which computer was being used to rifle through sensitive files. It belonged to a rookie detective called Charles Fletcher a long-time friend of the Gunn family. Soon, police would tap his phone calls and bug the room he worked in. I mean, we've got fucking, got so much foot blown off, balaclavered up, but we've got no forensic and, no. and he's not playing. I mean, he knows who fucking shot him. Yeah. He knows without a shadow of a doubt, but he's not yeah. going to put himself in that situation. No, that's right. Because he'll get killed next time. Yeah, he doesn't want to do it again. No. Detective Constable Fletcher was phoning a mate at an upmarket clothes shop where he used to work. His contact, Jason Grocock, was also a friend of Colin Gunn. Fletcher gave him information from various police computer systems and filled him in on Operation Stealth. What were you going to say to anyway? Um, yeah, I can talk now because there's people, there's people in the office. Um, Stealth, I mean, stealth and those operations like that will keep everything dead secret anyway because I don't want to have any problems there. I just felt really, really betrayed. I mean, I knew Charlie Fletcher personally. And for me, this was just, you know, the ultimate betrayal, I think, to me, my colleagues in the police service, that somebody can pass the information that we hold into a criminal network, putting people's lives and safety at risk, not only of the public, but of my officers. It hurts. I saw Charles Fletcher, yes, as a corrupt police officer, yes, as a contemptible individual, but I primarily saw him as another front we could open up on Colin Gunn.
And, you know, you can put all the kind of moralising around the fact there was a corrupt cop in there if you want, but the key bit was he was an opportunity to bring down Colin Gunn, and that was the biggest game in town as far as I was concerned. Chief Constable Steve Green decided to set up a secret operation nested within stealth, but known only to a trusted few. He needed a band of untouchables beyond corruption. Project Starburst, created to dismantle the Bestwood crime gang, was housed in a nondescript industrial unit away from force headquarters. National Crime Squad officers were brought in to help, and within Starburst were hidden two even more secret operations, one to target Colin Gunn, the other to deal with corrupt cops. There was a relatively small core of people, maybe not more than 50 um, in total, who worked under incredible pressure, who worked amazingly long hours, whose families saw precious little of them, but they were the people who kept this thing going day after day after day between 2003 and 2005. They were in no doubt that if they were identified um, while this thing was going on, that their own lives and their own families' lives could be at risk. Starburst employed sophisticated surveillance techniques used to combat terrorist gangs in Northern Ireland. Phones were tapped, mobile calls tracked, and the number one target followed on camera from a series of secret locations. Police began to uncover the complexity of the gun empire. What people don't realise, that these people are doing it as a legit business, like a company. Everyone's got their job. It's like the people on the floor. It's like foremen's charge engines. Everyone's got their place, and everyone has to do what they're told. The way that Colin and David Gunn operated was quite sophisticated. Colin Gunn was the head of the organisation. His own brother was in charge of part of the organisation but had no knowledge of what was going on elsewhere. So if you look at it, they would operate in silos, really. You'd have somebody, i.e. David, in charge of supplying amphetamine, somebody else supplying heroin and cocaine, somebody else dishing out punishment beatings and intimidation, but none of them would be aware of who was involved in the other bit. So they kept it separate, which made their organisation really difficult to penetrate. Every army needs a general, and with a general comes your lieutenants, your sergeants, and it's rank, it's rank. and you've got to have your soldiers. You can't have, you can't have too many leaders, because you'll clash and it'll all go wrong. So obviously he was a good leader and he had good soldiers. Do you know what I mean? But it kept everyone in order. To get to the top of the organisation, i.e. Colin Gunn and a few of the trusted individuals, we had to take away the foot soldiers, take away the layers of their organisation to bring them down to a position that made them vulnerable. Among the activities Charlie Fletcher was engaged in, a search for John and Joan Sterland. There was no operational reason why he should have been looking for them, in the event, he found nothing on the systems he could access. In December 2003, the Stirlands moved from Yorkshire to a bungalow on the east coast in the Lincolnshire seaside town of Trusthorpe. They had declined witness protection and chosen the spot themselves. They didn't know it was very close to where the Gunn family had a holiday home and a caravan. Mrs. Sterling's son, Michael O'Brien, who tried to kill Colin Gunn's nephew and shot his best friend instead, was about to go on trial and fuel still further Gunn's desire for revenge. When maverick gunman Michael O'Brien tried to shoot dead a member of a much-feared crime family, he sparked a chain of events that was to lead to a double murder which horrified the country. O'Brien had fallen out with pub doorman Jamie Gunn, nephew of organised crime lord Colin Gunn. But in the dark, O'Brien had killed Jamie's best friend, Marvin Bradshaw, instead. The police got to O'Brien before Gunn's gang could find him, but O'Brien's mother and stepfather were forced to flee Nottingham and go into hiding after an attempt on their lives. On July the 12th, 2004, O'Brien was convicted of murder. His behaviour in the dock was to make matters much worse for his parents. The court descended into chaos 
uh, as Michael O'Brien made various taunts at um, Marvin Bradshaw's family, which included gross comments about how Marvin Bradshaw's head looked like a donut after he'd shot him. He threw a cup of water over the family and said, I'm a bad boy, you know, I can do 20 years standing on my head. And he also pointed to Colin Gunn and made a gesture that implied that there was a bullet waiting for him as well, at which point Colin Gunn erupted and had to be escorted from the courtroom. Jamie Gunn never recovered from the events that cost his best friend his life. He had cradled him in his arms during his dying moments. Jamie had slipped into drug addiction and illness. Three weeks after O'Brien was jailed, Jamie Gunn died. Meanwhile, corrupt detective Charlie Fletcher sprang into action, again trying to find out where O'Brien's parents, John and Joan Sterland, were hiding. There was still no trace of them on the police computer. Colin Gunn turned to other intelligence sources. Two BT employees came up with an address, unaware of why it was wanted, at Trustthorpe in Lincolnshire. Suddenly, Colin Gunn went on holiday. Detectives are investigating the shootings of a couple thought to be in their 50s and from Nottinghamshire. They'd only moved to the coast a few months ago. Two men dressed in dark boiler suits, each carrying a handgun of some kind, went into the home address. Mr. Sterland was in the living room, and Mrs. Sterland was in the bedroom. Mr. Sterland shot six times, Mrs. Sterland four times, and both guns were used on both victims. It was early, -ish, say two ish, maybe up just a little after we heard these two bangs we thought might have been the coast guard with the lifeguards off to sort someone out in difficulty but it turned out it was gunshots the two men walked out of the address walked calmly to a nearby car Volkswagen Passat that was previously stolen it was driven to a remote location three or four miles away the car and we assumed the boiler suits gloves that would have been worn and anything else was set on fire and destroyed and from there, the two men dispersed by car. Murder squad detectives already knew there was a Nottingham link. On the day of the murders, Joan Sterland had phoned Nottinghamshire police to report a prowler in her garden. They, in turn, called Lincolnshire police. By the time they turned out, the couple were dead. In essence, what the officer thought he was attending was a historic report of a prowler. Um, clearly, in hindsight, uh, there was a lot more to it than that, but that's what would have been in the officer's mind when he attended that address. As investigators learned the whole story, their attention turned to Colin Gunn. While you could have a reasonably good idea at whose behest it may have taken place, proving that is quite a different matter. So it was a whodunit, but it wasn't a complete mystery. The killers had been careful to leave behind little forensic evidence. Police would have to find another way to solve these murders. Days after the hit, Detective Fletcher received urgent new instructions from his gangland contact. He was to check police computers for anything about the Sterling investigation, the burned out car, and whether Colin Gunn's name was in the frame. But with another force handling the murder inquiry, he was struggling. That whole investigation is really one point that the week of the murders was also the week of Jamie Gunn's funeral. It was an impressive show of solidarity for the Gunn family as hundreds lined the streets for the occasion. It was actually teeming down with rain that day, and yet there were probably a 1,000 people littered around the streets uh, looking at this funeral, the black horse-drawn variety. And um, there was a real air of menace as well. There were a lot of people who probably never even met the lad, 
who were willing to come and pay their respects because that was what was expected. Certainly, notes had gone round to some houses to make sure that they came out for the funeral. The Gunn family obviously were very, very popular on the Bestwood estate. You know, they'd lived there all their life. So it didn't really come as a surprise to me that there'd be so much outpouring of grief. Jamie was clearly a favourite of Colin Gunn, and we know that the death of Jamie Gunn hit both Colin and his brother and the community in Bestwood really, really hard, and it really did stir up some feeling within that community. Detectives investigating the Stirland murders began going through hours of footage from security cameras in the area. At Ingermells near Skegness, about 12 miles south of the crime scene, the camera showed Colin Gunn and two of his associates, Michael McNee and John Russell, at a caravan park where the Gunn family had a van. It put them in the area that weekend, but proved little else. The breakthrough came on CCTV in Mablethorpe, a mile and a half from the Stirlands bungalow, where Colin Gunn is seen here in the main street. But this time, he used his mobile phone. Police had the precise time of the call from these pictures. By analysing phone records, they could identify the phone he was using and the numbers that he called, including mobiles belonging to the two henchmen seen at the caravan park. Detectives could track their movements using the signals sent from the phones to nearby masts. The 80-mile drive from Nottingham to the coast, trips to Trusthorpe, and a high volume of calls at all times of the day and night. They were piecing together extremely small parts of the jigsaw, mainly from forensic evidence, and by forensic evidence I mean perhaps the obvious fingerprint DNA but also mobile phone usage, tiny snippets of CCTV footage from caravan site from public CCTV. And by doing this, they put together a jigsaw which created the picture of how the murder was carried out and put Colin Gunn and associates very near to the scene. After eight months of assembling this digital puzzle, police decided they had enough to arrest Colin Gunn. He had been arrested today on suspicion of the murder of um, Joan and John Sterland. Can you tell us where you were on the 8th of August, which is a Sunday? This is the day that Mr and Mrs Sterling were killed. For someone like Colin Gunn, being arrested is an occupational hazard, and uh, from his behaviour, um, he didn't display any sign of concern. His expectation may well have been that he'd be interviewed, released on bail, uh, and that would be that. He was subjected to over 11 hours of interview, during most of which uh, he said absolutely nothing in response to the questions and the evidence being put to him. The bottom line is, Clive, we believe that all roads lead back to you and your family that are behind this, the killing of Mr. and Mrs. Sterland. It was literally an assassination. Is there anything you want to say about the events of that weekend and the, and the days leading up to the killing? He said a few things fairly briefly right at the end of that process um, and they were more a brief statement of his position in respect to the evidence that had been put to him rather than you know throwing his hands up to confess or anything like that. I just want to say that I had nothing whatsoever to do with it. I was up the coast with my family and friends. I met family and friends. I went to different parts of the coast and that's all I've done. All I've done is gone down the coast I travelled about the coast because I was on, on, on holiday, which I do most weekends because I've got a van down there. And, you know, it's not unusual for me to do exactly what you're saying I did. My mum's got a place, like you say, right near there. Unfortunately, my mum's place happens to be right near to where it happened. But that don't, that, that don't mean that has anything to do with me. It's just that's where my mum's place is situated which is where a lot of the activity that you're suggesting I was doing was around, but that's because my mum's place is there. My nephew had just died. My mum's grieving. To be fair, though, um, we felt that um, with a combination of other things taking place at around the same time and the product of the inquiries that had taken place previously, 
we were hopeful that we would be in a position to charge him without having to depend on anything he said in an interview. I mean, I'm shocked that you've got me and accusing me of these things on the nature of, of, of what you're suggesting is, is just phone calls. We put you at the scene of the crime at the right time, haven't we? You put my phones, if they're my phones, in the area. Well, what we're saying, Colin, is that there's not only your phone in that area, but there's also McNeese phone in that area. Well, but if, phone if, in that area. If you had all a, the material at the time, if you had a chap here, sat here, you'd probably get his friends' phones. We've told you what we think, and we've told you what the evidence is. Well, it's not evidence, evidence is it? We, well, it is evidence, yeah. Following that process, he was charged with the offence of conspiracy to murder. At that point, he still remained fairly cool, fairly calm, and fairly collected. But I think the process of being taken to Lincolnshire, firstly, and then being charged will have both been surprises to him. Meanwhile, the net was closing on corrupt cop Charlie Fletcher. The untouchables hidden inside Project Starburst had cloned his computer so they could see everything he was doing. They continued to monitor his phone calls to his contact behind the racks of Armani suits at Limey's clothes store. After months of surveillance, they moved in on Fletcher. At his home, they found further evidence, reports and documents that Fletcher should not have had in his possession. We will never definitively know whether or not Charles Fletcher um, joined the police service as a corrupt officer or joined innocently and then became a corrupt officer. What we do know is that the corrupt network that he belonged to um, had relationships between him and other people that pre-existed his time in the police service. We know that for a fact. Turn your engine off, mate, police. The team investigating corruption had also found another bad apple. Vice Squad Officer Philip Parr, seen here in a television documentary promising justice to those who break the law. The main uh, responsibility of our unit is to target the curb cause. So it, it is quite clear, you come to Nottingham, you're going to get prosecuted. Parr would now be prosecuted for passing sensitive information to Colin Gunn. But the biggest trial that lay ahead was the Stirland murder trial. Colin, his older brother David, and six other men stood accused of plotting the couple's execution. It was a trial that would end in a riot. He's got a white top on with dark sleeves. He has changed that shirt in the last five minutes. That lad wants nicking as soon as we can get in there. In March 2006, crime gang boss Colin Gunn his brother David and six other men went on trial at Birmingham Crown Court, accused of plotting the execution of a middle-aged couple. John and Joan Sterland were gunned down in their bungalow, where they were in hiding after Mrs. Sterland's son tried to assassinate a member of the Gunn family. There was no evidence as to who pulled the trigger, but a jigsaw of CCTV, mobile phone calls, text messages and other forensic evidence put Colin Gunn and two associates in the area on the day of the murder with a motive. Colin Gunn lost control twice during a trial lasting more than three months for conspiracy to murder. Once when the verdict of guilty was returned and he directed uh, a stream of obscene abuse at the jury, particularly the jury foreman, uh, saying things like, I hope you die of AIDS. The second time was when he was about to be sentenced by the judge and a similar stream of obscene abuse towards the judge. Uh, he was directed to be taken from the dock and he was sentenced in his absence to life imprisonment, a minimum 35 years. The jailing of Colin Gunn provoked a riot on his home estate. The community's just got together and absolutely fuming. 35 years! Police wearing riot gear keep their distance, cordoning off both ends of the roads to prevent the violence from spreading. He's got a white top on with dark sleeves. He has changed that shirt in the last five minutes. That lad wants nicking as soon as we can get in there. What you hear in the paper and the people think this, people think that, it's a load of crap. Excuse my uh, French. It's a load of crap. He took guns off people, didn't he? Yes. Did he not, Victoria? Yes. If people yeah. was known to be running around this estate Thank with you. firearms, Colin took him off it. Yeah. Colin 
Ballon looked after everybody on Bestwood. If it wasn't for him, it would be like this every night. He is innocent. He's a good man. If you want to try and put some kind of moral spin on what he did, then you've got to go and tell that. You've got to go and justify that to the widows, uh, to the uh, to the mums who've lost their sons. You've got to go and tell that to all those grieving people who are who have been the victims of the evil that Colin Gunn has brought about this city. Got a reputation as an odd lad. That don't mean he caused all the trouble. In, There's the trouble no heroin in on this estate. There's, There's no, no heroin on this estate because of him. There will be heroin addicts. Um, in the city who would not be heroin addicts had it not been for the activities of Colin Gunn and his business. There are people whose health has been irrevocably broken down where that would never have happened had it not been for Colin Gunn. It's all based on lies, it's all a load of rubbish, and when I take it to the High Court in London, it can be thrown out and he'll be home where he belongs. Michael McNee and John Russell were given long sentences for conspiracy to murder the Stirlings. The other defendants, including Colin's brother David, were cleared. Why had Colin Gunn become so personally involved in the hit on the Stirlings? Revenge is a powerful motive, especially in the code of the underworld. If it's personal, you can't let it go. It, it, it'll be like a cancer, it'll eat you alive. When you get in a position of power, you, like most leaders, you, you, you can give the order. It's easier done, and then you're away from it, you're an oddity, you've got, you got, you got your alibis and everything. But if it's personal, well, if it's personal, it's got to be done. And if you've got to be involved and do it yourself, well, then that's the way it's got to be. Then you've got to look over your shoulder and think, well, I'm now looking at prison, losing my life, everything I've built up for, everything I've gained on the street, all my power, position, money, wealth, it's gonna, you're going to throw it out the window. But if it means that much to you, then that don't mean nothing. You've got to do it. Gunn was given a further nine years for infiltrating Nottinghamshire police. His main informant, Detective Constable Charlie Fletcher, was jailed for seven years, having seemingly gained little by way of reward for betraying his colleagues. We were all interested about, you know, what was, what was his price? You know, what did he actually get for, for, for um, compromising potentially five serious operations that we've been involved in investigating? And I guess we were shocked, but probably more bemused to find that it wasn't money, um, it wasn't drugs, it wasn't a lifestyle, it was a handful of Armani suits. 81 operations by Project Starburst saw many of the gun gang's foot soldiers and lieutenants taken off the streets. Police seized large quantities of cocaine, heroin and ecstasy tablets. David Gunn was jailed for trafficking amphetamines, caught after he was forced to become personally involved with so many of his subordinates out of action. But it was a bittersweet victory, only by uncovering corruption within its own ranks had the Nottinghamshire investigation been able to bring charges against Colin Gunn. The intensity of that operation had put a strain on the 50 or so untouchables who had lived and breathed it. So that was probably approaching three to four years of my life, you know, work, doing nothing else but that. It's incredibly stressful. It has a massive effect on you, on your family, I guess your health and I suppose your sanity. Colin Gunn will be 74 years old when he gets out of prison. The question is whether his absence leaves a power vacuum on the Bestwood estate that has to be filled. What you've got to understand is, if you have a dealer, you get rid of that dealer, there's another dealer to replace it. If there's a criminal running in the streets doing this, if he goes, there's someone to replace him, and that's what it's all about. There'll always be the Colin Guns and the Marcells in, in London doing the jobs that you do. If they're going to make their calculations about do they want to get involved in this or not, let me give them some certainties. We will catch them. They will not see us coming and that when we've caught them, we will build a case against them and they will go to prison for years and years and years. And those things are certain for them. If they want to make that choice, then that's their choice. But I'm happy to tell them what the end game will look like. But the police are still concerned about Colin Gunn's possible influence behind bars. Being in prison is really going to be a difficult thing for him. 
I suppose to comprehend because 35 years is a long time and it gives you a long time to think but you know at the end of the day he's still a significant criminal and still exerts in my view significant influence on the estate which is something that we have to continue the work that we're doing there to actually make that a better place for the residents of Bestwood. Whilst you know I do believe that you know we have re recovered the Bestwood estate from him we can't ignore him and, and I think you know that the old ideas about once they're in prison you can forget about him that does not hold good for Colin Gunn. Well, as the competition heats up, the temperatures continue to plummet as the five remaining celebrities reach reindeer country, the coldest region they've encountered so far. 71 degrees north is tomorrow at 9.